I would like to uh, introduce our speaker today, Dr. John Ivers. We are uh, honored to have him with us today. Uh, Dr. Ivers is a professor of languages and international studies at BYU-Idaho, just up the road here from the museum. And um, he has a, a doctorate in education from UNC Greensboro, um, a, a fine educational school, and has taught at Ricks College slash BYU-Idaho since before that transition, since 1989. And uh, is during that time been a department chair and a dean, and he has taught courses in a number of disciplines, including in Spanish language, as well as subjects such as philosophies of the modern world, cultural paradigms, and uh, numerous education courses on how to teach to different uh, to students of different backgrounds, cultures, and learning styles. Uh, he has also published a book uh, recently called For Deep Thinkers Only, How Culture Manipulates Your Reality. And, and so if you enjoyed uh, the discussion today, I think you'll get a, a more, of, more of that uh, you know, expanded view in his book, which uh, we'll also send out a link a little bit later if you'd like a direct link uh, to purchase the book for yourself. And, and finally, Dr. Ivers has a long history of community service here in Eastern Idaho as well. And uh, we are, are proud to, to note that he is also a member here at the Museum of Idaho and has been for some time. And so uh, he, is, he is one of us in a number of different ways. And so without further ado, uh, I will turn the time over to Dr. John Ivers. Uh, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate the amazing work that you do and, uh, and all the sacrifices you make for our community. What a blessing it is to be able to uh, um, make a, a living and at the same time serve our great community and we all appreciate you very very much and what are an honor it is for me to be able to address all of you uh, the many unsung heroes out there who support the Museum of Idaho this organization is truly a gem in the gem state and it has a disproportionately high impact on intellectualism in our little remote corner of the world here and appreciate that organization very, very much. You know, the title of my talk today is How Culture Impacts Our Interpretation of the World. And in this talk today, I'm not gonna get into too many particulars of cultural differences. We'll get into some. You can read about all the particulars in my book and also in many other uh, books that are out there. Uh, what I want to talk about today is I want to discuss the general power of culture, a concept that is extremely obvious uh, throughout the world, but most human beings never totally grasp it. And um, at least, you know, one of the least understood facts is that culture is one of the most powerful forces in the conscious universe. It is so powerful that it um, impacts to a large degree our perceptions of ourselves. One study came out recently and came, that came to the determination that our self-esteem is culture bound. Yeah, our self-esteem is culture bound. I'm not sure it's 100% culture bound, but it's, it's probably significantly so. And you know, and, and the fact that, cult, that our self-esteem is culture bound makes culture that much more important and that much more worthy of our study. For example, right now, one out of every three Americans has a self-concept dominated by the negative, according to the studies, one out of every three Americans. That means that one out of every three of us thinks more negative things about ourselves than positive things, one out of, one out of three. In fact, our self-concepts are so fragile. I think all of us struggle with fragile, self-esteem and that sort of thing. Our, our self-concepts are so fragile that it, according to another study, it takes 14 positive experiences to make up for the self-esteem damage inflicted by one similar negative experience. Yeah, it takes 14 similar positive experiences to make up for the self-esteem damage inflicted by one similar negative experience. Let me give you an example. As I am leaving this Zoom lecture today, 
if I hear one of you say something like, man, that Ivers guy, that Ivers guy was so boring, man. And then, man, I hope the rest of the lecture series at the Museum of Idaho is not going to be like this, or I'm like wasting my time, man. If I hear one of you say that, I'm going to have to hear 14 of you folks say, man, I was digging everything he said, man. It was like pure enlightenment, man. I haven't felt this way since the 60s, baby. I'm going to have to hear 14 of you say that before my self-esteem is restored to the level it was before I heard the negative comment. That is how fragile we are. However, our self-esteem and our self-concepts are all both blessed and cursed by what is called the culturally created ought self. See, every single culture creates an ought self. How the typical man in that culture ought to be, how the typical woman in that culture ought to be, okay? And every culture's ought self is a little bit different. Every subculture, like there's many different subcultures within the United States, okay? Every subculture's ought self for the male and the female are different, okay? So most of, the, most of these culturally created ought selves that are out there are, and most of every one of them is good and rational, yeah. Most of the ought self in every single culture and subculture is good and rational. However, here and there, there are some elements in every culturally created ought self that are irrational and detrimental. For example, think of your high school subculture back in the day when you guys were going to high school. You know, every high school has its own little subculture, you know. Among the students in that subculture was the ought self that was dominant among the students. I'm not talking about what the teachers were talking about, but it was among the young people there. You know, was that reasonable? Was that rational? You know, or were there kids that were good kids, really good kids, but they just didn't conform to the ought self expectations and never became popular and maybe were even persecuted. See, I'm an educator and I realize, and I've also taught in the public schools way back in the 80s, way back in the 80s when the music was like really good, you know, I taught in the public schools back in those days. And I realize that a lot of young, young people today and then um, are victims of a lot of bullying and other forms of rejection because they may not measure up to certain subcultural or cultural standards and expectations. And I'm sure it's always been that way in the history of humanity. And I know, there's, I know there's many heroic teachers trying to do their best to ameliorate some of these situations. However, after all of this is said and done, the unpopular young woman still goes home and cries on her pillow. And the unpopular young man still walks through the hallways with fear in his eyes. I know there's not a lot we can do about this. However, these cruel realities should never be far from our thinking and our teaching. You know, cultural differences can be so vast that people can have completely identical characteristics. However, if they live in different cultures, one will have high self-esteem and the other will have low self-esteem even with identical characteristics. It just depends on what the culturally created ought self is dictating. Here are some areas where the culturally created ought self might be different from culture to culture. Body weight. What's the perfect weight for a person to have? I'm not talking about for you know, health or anything like that, but just appearance and what is, a, what is the approved weight in every culture? Well, it varies from every culture in every culture. For example, 80% of the men in the world, 80% of the men in the world prefer a woman who is heavier than the American super skinny ideal. 80% of the men in the world. In fact, you know, as long as you look healthy, okay, no matter what your weight is, as long as you look healthy. Now, if you're anorexic looking, you don't look healthy. And if you're extremely obese, you don't look healthy. 
but everything in between, you can look healthy. As long as you look healthy, you can have an attractive looking weight in some culture today or in some culture back in time, okay? That's how powerful culture is. Another interesting thing that the ought self can influence is our desire for public recognition. For example, here in the United States, we have a culturally created hunger for recognition. Yeah, culturally created hunger for recognition. We seek it out all the time and do all kinds of crazy things sometimes for it. However, in some cultures, and probably the majority of people in the world are in cultures like this, they do everything they can to avoid public recognition, especially cultures in Asia. Cultures in Asia are what are called highly collectivistic cultures. And, and the Japanese have a saying that the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. It's not, an, not a perfect translation, but it's pretty close. The nail that sticks out gets hammered down. And so they do everything they can to avoid public recognition, and they are embarrassed by public recognition, but yet we have a hunger for it and crave it. Another element that may be influenced by the ought self would be materialism. Okay, all I assume, it's my assumption that materialism, wanting to collect a lot of stuff, uh, probably exists in all cultures. I assume it exists in all cultures. However, in the United States, we have definitely created into a fine art and, uh, but how important is it to spend your whole life collecting stuff? In some cultures, it's more important than others. And the culture manipulates your needs and your desires and sometimes your problems. A lot of our needs are false needs. A lot of our problems are false problems. They're culturally created needs and culturally created problems that very often make our lives very, very miserable. Another interesting thing about cultural influence is friendliness. What is too friendly and what is not friendly enough? Okay, you'll see big differences throughout, throughout the world. Now, the one good thing about the, the, the United States is, uh, you know how a lot of people out there don't like us, which kind of irritates me and probably irritates a lot of Americans. But, um, but you know, the, in the United States, Americans are well known for being friendly. Yeah, isn't that a good thing? That's a good thing. We're well known for being very, very friendly people. However, different cultures draw the line in different places as far as what is too friendly and what is not friendly enough. And with these lines being drawn in different places, sometimes our American friendliness in different cultures can get us in trouble. Sometimes we come across as being flippant and undignified. And sometimes, you know, you know, the American way, when you see a stranger that you don't know and you pass them on the street or in the hallway, you maybe smile and say hi. If you're ever in another culture, don't do that. That's a cool American thing that I dig, you know, the cool American thing that I dig. However, in most cultures in the world, our culture is all about interpretation, all about interpretation. They will interpret your action differently than an American will. They will interpret you as being some sort of crazy person, maybe a sexual pervert or something, okay? And so, as, or, or maybe or maybe being rude. And so it's um, very important to kind of know these things, okay? It is gratifying to know that we Americans have the reputation for being friendly throughout the world. Another interesting thing about the ought self is that um, what is too intellectual? In the United States, we are considered by anthropologists, and it's going to be a little bit of a shock, but we are considered by anthropologists to be an anti-intellectual people. Yeah, we're considered to be an anti-intellectual people. And how can that be? Because we have the greatest universities in the world. We're the greatest universities in the world. But yeah, we're considered to be an anti-intellectual people. In the United States, we're kind of suspicious of philosophers and intellectuals and things like that. Okay, we're always, they're always suspect, you know? And I don't know why that is, but I imagine it has something to do with our history. You know, we're a relatively new country and we had to push back the frontier, which required a lot of work. 
and death was always very, very near. If you were a pioneer or something like that, you didn't get the crops in or something like that, you could die. And I guess if a person were sitting around philosophizing all the time, then that wasn't very helpful, okay? It could be dangerous. And so maybe for that reason, we're an anti-intellectual country, even though we do have the best universities in the world. And that's not just my opinion, that's pretty much understood. Another interesting thing that the ought self might influence is living with ambiguity, okay? There's this thing called uncertainty avoidance. And Americans are relatively low on uncertainty avoidance. We're comfortable with the gray in life. Now, not all Americans are. It depends what, depends what subculture you're a member of. Some more conservatively religious groups are less comfortable with the gray, okay? However, in some countries, they are very, very uncomfortable with the gray. Everything has to be black or white and uh, you need to know exactly where you stand and you're supposed to find the answers with authority figures and that sort of thing. And gray areas really disturb them where it doesn't disturb most Americans. We, most of us Americans believe that life has a lot of gray in it and that's just the way life is, okay? And we need to kind of enjoy the mystery of the gray areas in life, okay? And there's many, many other things that the ought self influence. I just gave you just a few little examples. See, the farther the, okay, is the farther the distance between, again, the farther the distance between the real self and the ought self, okay, okay, the lower your self-esteem will be because you're not very close to what the society expects of you. But the shorter the distance between the ought self and the real self, the way you really are, the higher your self-esteem will be because you conform more to those expectations. But what if the ought self is irrational, which every ought self is in, every, in the world, in every culture is at least partially irrational. We can talk, we've already talked about some of those things and we'll talk more as this lecture progresses. Anyway, as I mentioned above, culture can even help determine how attractive someone is. And you talk about people's self-esteem being devastated. Okay, and also the studies have shown that the more people are considered attractive in their particular culture, then the more likely they are to move up in the world. And, um, and that's kind of disturbing, that's kind of disturbing. And, um, and so anyway, cultural paradigms are so diverse throughout the world that I would venture to say that everyone in this cyber room right now could be a sex symbol at some point in the cultural space-time continuum. Yeah, yeah. Even I would be a sex symbol somewhere. Hmm. Um, somewhere. Hmm. Let's see. However, unfortunately, most of us were probably born at the wrong point of the cultural space-time continuum. I think maybe I was born in the wrong culture. You know, when I was uh, in high school, you know, I used to ask my mom, I used to say, well, why don't the girls like me? Why don't the girls like me? And my mother used to tell me, son, if a girl likes you, she ignores you. You know, I'm not sure that's right. I'm not sure that's right. Because if that's right, that means that 100% that the girls in my high school must have been crazy about me. Yeah. But anyway, culture has that kind of power. Now there are things too that are evolutionary in nature. There are things that, attract, that make you attractive that are universal probably bestowed to us by evolution. But most of those things are noticed subconsciously. A lot of things we notice consciously are culturally taught. Now keep in mind that uh, many of us out there, many of you out there within the sound of my voice, may be victims one way or another of culturally created ought selves that are irrational, or maybe someone you love is. It never hurts to critically evaluate our cultural paradigms and say, do I really believe that? Do I really believe that? I know other people believe that. 
Seems like everybody I know believes that. But do I really believe that? See, life is too short sometimes for us to not ask ourselves those sort of questions. You know, in 1930, two Australian miners were searching for gold in a part of New Guinea where it was believed that few, if any, humans had ever been. The land was considered to be uninhabited and uninhabitable. Camped on a mountain ridge at dusk, they watched as the receding daylight revealed a multitude of points of light, obviously coming from campfires in the huge valley below. And remember, they didn't think anybody had ever lived there. It was the first glimpse of a civilization, a civilization untouched by the modern world. Remember, this was 1930. A civilization that had developed in isolation for thousands of years, a civilization of 50,000 people living in the Stone Age, unaware that any other humans walked the earth. His book, The Third Chimpanzee, geographer Jared Diamond mentions an expedition which entered the valley in 1938 and the shock experienced by both parties. It was a collision of two worlds, a collision exacerbated not only by extreme technological differences, but also by major gulfs in, in, um, in sexual behavior and perceptions of physical modesty and assumptions on the very nature of the world. Diamond says there was not a single individual of the Grand Valley of New Guinea, born at least five or six years previous to the event, who does not remember exactly where he or she was at that surreal time when the walls of their reality came tumbling down. Let's look at the evening before that first contact. The evening before the first contact was likely no different than many others throughout the valley's 7,000 years of human habitation. During that final evening, the very last one when their culturally created reality still exercised its grip. Life meandered on as usual, replete with culturally created pride, pleasure, and pain. Maybe that evening, a young man sat outside his hut, staring at the fire with a heavy heart, because a holy man had publicly declared that due to a recent illness, his soul substance had retreated from his sternum to his backbone, and therefore undermined his moral and spiritual judgment. The holy, holy man's diagnosis was clearly confirmed when the young man accidentally stepped over a young child, making the child unclean. Maybe that evening, a young girl, as she fed her family's pigs, tried to hold back the tears as other girls snickered at her three-fingered hand as two fingers had to be sacrificed to her father's ghost. Maybe that evening. A grown man cringed inwardly as he wondered if people would find out he had been negligent, negligent in placating his, his deceased ancestors, a sin that no doubt brought about his brother's untimely death and likely offended mountain gods. Maybe that evening, a grown woman preparing her earth oven to cook a meal stared into it with a look of inferiority because she was purchased with a lower bride price and it was widely known that she once accidentally spoke the name of her mother-in-law. You no, know, for 7,000 years, one evening after another, culturally created pain hovered over the valley like fog in a lowland winter morning. But it was not unique to the Grand Valley of the Dani people in New Guinea. It is a ubiquitous fact of human existence. It's everyone. It's everywhere. 
it's us, all of us, no matter what culture we're in, are in pain to one degree or another due to irrational cultural paradigms and due to some of the irrational things in our culture that cause us stress, okay? That we've never challenged. They were challenged at least within ourselves. You know, some of my Asian students who get an A minus are in pain. When I was in college, I was real happy to get an A minus. I was happy to get a B. They're in pain when they get an A minus. It's a culturally created pain. The Mexican male student who can't dance very well is in pain. I've had some of my Mexican students tell me that a Mexican male needs to dance very, very, very well, be a great dancer. The American woman whose weight does not conform to the current super skinny American ideal may be in pain. The problem is that it's hard to question these paradigms that so manipulate our realities. We accept many of them as givens. That's just the way life is. Okay. All these situations in New Guinea I just talked about were initiated and maintained by people and formed by paradigms that they never bothered to question. They may never have questioned the culturally induced interpretations that were forced upon them. As I mentioned earlier, culture is all about interpretation. Paradigms are models of reality that we use to interpret the cultural world around us. And paradigms differ from culture to culture, causing people to interpret their realities very, very differently and causing people outside of the culture to in, in misinterpret the motives of the other people, okay? This creates a considerable amount of cross-cultural misunderstanding. The interpretation of any abstract concept will differ somewhat from culture to culture. Examples of abstract concepts could be like, what is hypocrisy? What is humility? See, the line as far as what is humble or what is maybe too humble is in different places in one culture to another. Another one might be, what is arrogance? See, yeah, different cultures will have a higher bar for arrogance and different cultures have a lower bar for arrogance. Here in the United States, the line is drawn in different places, okay? What might be considered arrogant, maybe in the South or in Idaho or something like that, might not be considered very arrogant where I come from in Philadelphia or like someone from New York or something like that. What is spirituality? Yeah, in many places in the world, you're not considered spiritual unless you're very vocal and very, very loud about your spirituality when you're in church and that sort of thing. But in some places in the world, you're not considered spiritual unless you're reverent and very quiet. What is immodesty, like physical immodesty? When I was looking over the, the pictures of the people in the room, and every picture of every lady I saw strikes me as, they strike me as very, very modest, very, very modest. But yet, since I didn't see any of you with your head covered, some men in the world might interpret you as being very immodest. Okay, what is modesty is, can be very, vastly different from culture to culture. What is flirtation? That's something very, very important to know because it can get you in trouble if you don't understand what is considered flirtatious in one culture or another. In some cultures in this world, if a man were to go up to a woman and just have a casual conversation with her about the weather, or even ask her directions, that might be considered flirtatious. And her male relatives could attack you, okay? And so things can be dangerous. We already talked about what is friendliness. What is honesty? Yeah, every culture has a different line where truth distortion is unacceptable. See, truth, dist truth distortion 
is acceptable to a certain degree in every culture. You see, if we could not distort the truth, sometimes, civilization as we know it would probably collapse. And most of our marriages would probably collapse too. Okay, there has to be a certain degree of truth distortion sometimes, okay? And so, but each culture has a different line of when the truth distortion is acceptable or when it is unacceptable, okay? And so different cultures may be practicing acceptable truth distortion when we in the United States will look at them negatively, they think they're liars, they're just dishonest and that sort of thing. Where in their culture, they can might consider it acceptable truth distortion. Another interesting thing is emotional expressivity tolerance. Different cultures have different ideas on how much public emotional expressivity you can show, okay? Okay, for example, there are many cultures in this world, and all of you know people like this, where they let it all hang out. They just express their emotions in public, and it's no big deal. And there are many other cultures where they're very, very quiet, and they look at emotional expressivity in public with horror. Okay, here in Idaho, we have low emotional expressivity tolerance generally, where people are not very expressive of their emotions in public, except for certain situations. Okay, but you go to other places like where I'm from in Philadelphia, and they have, where I'm from in Philadelphia, they have high emotional expressivity tolerance. They'll talk to you in Philadelphia like they'll come up to a good friend and they'll say, hey, what's the matter with you? What's the matter? Are you stupid or something? What's the matter with you? Listen, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? That's stupid. Let me tell you something. Have I ever told you wrong? Huh? Have I ever told you wrong? Oh, you're not answering the question? Okay, let me answer it for you. The answer is like, no. No, I've never told you wrong. Now listen, listen, do what I'm telling you to do, huh? Because you're messing things up, okay? Now, if you talk like that, someone in Philadelphia, they'll remain your friends. If anything, it's a bonding experience between friends, okay? But in some other cultures, like in the South, them would be fighting words, be the Hatfields and the McCoys all over again, you know? And it wouldn't go over very well here in Idaho either, see? And so different cultures have different levels of emotional expressivity tolerance and the people are on the high end. They look at people on the low end as being kind of dull, boring and holier than thou. Even if they're not holier than thou, they might be viewed as holier than thou and maybe even prejudiced. And people on the low end look at people on the high end of emotional expressivity as being nutcases, as being probably unhinged, threatening, probably dumb, and definitely dangerous. Yeah. And so you see the potential for misunderstanding between many groups. On, and then I just scratched the surface of all the different cultural things there. We'll talk about some more here in a little bit. Culture simply doesn't grant cursings. It also grants great blessings. However, even the blessings of certain cultural paradigms can be fraught with irrationality. Um, you know, a culture can imbue almost any person with impressiveness and almost any person with unimpressiveness is demonstrated by one of the greatest archeological mysteries of the Americas, which involves the subject of handicaps and deformity. You're gonna, when I'm talking through this, you're gonna wonder what does it have to do with culture, but it has to do with culture big time. And I'll explain it at the end. But, but this, again, culture can decide who is impressive and who is unimpressive. And that's dangerous, okay? But it could also decide how we look upon handicaps and deformities which gives opportunities for our brothers and sisters out there. And by the way, I'm using brothers and sisters in not any religious sense. I'm eating, using brothers and sisters in like the hippie sense, baby. Yeah, I'm a product of the 60s, man. Those were interesting times, yeah. And so our brothers and sisters who have handicaps and deformities, it gives us potential for culture to view them in positive ways instead of the often negative ways that make their lives 
our brothers, our brothers and sisters that suffer with those things so difficult. Now, we talk about an intriguing archaeological enigma that will likely never be solved and is relatively unknown in the non-archaeological world. The mystery has to do with the were jaguar of the Olmecs. Now, you know how we have the werewolf in our culture? Now, a werewolf is supposedly, okay, half man, half wolf, okay? And by the way, I don't believe there are werewolves. But you know something? During a period of 100 years in France, uh, during the late Middle Ages, 100,000 people were put on trial for being werewolves. And a bunch of them were executed because the culture said that werewolves definitely exist. The educated people at the time said that werewolves definitely existed. And of those 100,000 people that were put on trial for being werewolves, hmm, I wonder how many really were werewolves. Hmm, let's see, maybe like, maybe like, Maybe like none, none. How many tragedies occurred because of crazy cultural ideas? Well, anyway, as the werewolf was supposedly half man, half wolf, the were jaguar was half jaguar, half man. And the Olmex, as, as far as we know, is O-L-M-E-C-S. Olmex, as far as we know, were the mother culture of all of Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica, it, geographically speaking, started the northern part of it is kind of in central Mexico. And the southern boundaries was considered Mesoamerica, goes down to maybe northern Honduras. Okay, so we have like central Mexico down to northern Honduras. And the Olmecs were an advanced civilization inhabiting the area in Mexico around the Isthmus of Tehuantepec in Southern Mexico, the skinniest part of Mexico. And the civilization existed from around 1200 BC, could have been a couple hundred years before, but around 1200 BC to around 300 BC, okay? And their very existence was unknown until the latter 1800s. And there was this guy, like for almost 2,000 years, that huge civilization was lost. Until this guy was hacking through the dense jungle. And there appeared in front of him this humongous stone face. Yeah. There was a huge stone head out there in the jungle. It didn't appear to resemble any other artifact they knew from the civilizations they were aware of. It was the first of many colossal stone heads. And they're real big. I've stood beside them and I get about two thirds up, you know, on the head. The head is just huge, towers over me, just the head. It was one of many stone heads found in that dense jungle. And a lost civilization was rediscovered. And there are still many, th many things we don't know about the Olmecs. However one, however, one thing we do understand is that the jaguar held high religious significance in that culture and was likely either a deity or was the symbol of a deity. We don't know what. But after a while, archaeologists, as they started digging up the civilization, started not noticing an intriguing motif in that civilization. The area is replete with many artistic representations of what are called now were jaguar babies. Were jaguar babies. They're babies that look like they're half human, half jaguar, okay, in their faces. Okay. The typical motif consists, another thing too, the typical motif consists of a statue of a normal adult male in most cases, holding a baby, which seems to be half jaguar, half human. They find those little statues and statuettes all over the place, all over the place. And since this motif is so common in the Olmec archeological data, it must have constituted one of the most poignant 
and one of the most powerful stories in ancient America for a thousand years. And we have no idea what it was. But there's this guy holding this wear Jaguar baby all over the place. We have no idea what that story is. But it's probably extremely powerful. You know, um, considering all the evidence about that, that one of the greatest Mesoamerican archaeologists of all time, a guy by the name of Michael Coe, theorized that the wear Jaguar, a concept he considers to be central to Olmec civilization, could be the result of a mythical union between Jaguar gods and human beings. Okay. Okay. In other words, there's a significant possibility that Olmec religion followed similar archetypes as those found in the old world, like where people like Hercules, Dionysus, Romulus, and many others were supposedly the products of gods having relationships with uh, mortal human females. However, there's some interesting theoretical twists this idea. Actual babies born with, um, actual babies today, born with neural tube defects like spina bifida or even Down syndrome children, okay, resemble kind of some of those statues, okay? And could possibly have been interpreted in those days as children whose gods, whose, whose, whose fathers were actually gods, the jaguar gods. Now, if that's the case, those children would have undoubtedly been revered throughout their short lives. Okay, and many archaeologists have theorized that um, that could have very well been the case. And even though issues like spina bifida represent only one out of every 1,000 live births, propensities for those things run in families. And a royal Olmec family possessing the propensity and there's a lot of intermarriage among royal families, may have used it to their advantage to legitimize their rule. It would have been very helpful in maintaining one's power if everyone thought there were jaguar gods in one's family tree. Yeah. And if we're talking about Down syndrome babies, rather than spina bifida, or both, there would have been likely a greater number of these divine births. However, that's just another theory. We can't even be sure we're talking about actual births. It may have been that the Olmecs wanted to look like their jaguar gods so much that they practiced head and face deformation to shape normal people into the image of their jaguar gods. What we may be seeing among all those things is the aftermath of post-birth surgery. See, we see many representations of babies and adult males, adult males with heads that have obviously been deformed. Obviously when they were babies, the heads were, they put pressure on the heads to make sure the top of their head was smaller than the bottom of their head, kind of like a jaguar's head. And their upper lips were obviously cut off. So their teeth were always exposed, looking at, like a jaguar who was growling. Okay. And so, were they born that way? Or were they a result of cosmetic surgery to make them look more attractive? Did Olmec women swoon? over a male with an intentionally deformed head, mouth, and teeth. Hopefully they'd file their incisor teeth down so they were sharp. Yeah, don't think about that. It's too hard to bear. But they would file their incisor teeth down so they were sharp. Were males, but then there's some normal looking males too in the statues we find. Were males who lacked the social status or economic means to have the surgery? and the head deformation, and who looked normal 
Did they deal with culturally created insecurities all their lives? Did they long to look like the handsome males that had their heads deformed? Did the sound of a distant jaguar crying in the night remind those normal people of their own culturally created inadequacies? I'm gonna pause now and show you some of the archeology span of the Olmecs. And, and um, if things cooperate here, let me see, try to share this here. I'm gonna share the screen here. It's gonna go through a website. Okay, this is the Olmec territory in Southern Mexico, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. We lived in the Gulf of Mexico side of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Okay, let's go on down here. Okay. Here's a guy with the wear jaguar look. We just can't look at the skinny head because he's wearing a hat, but his upper lip is cut off. Okay. That would have been a handsome guy in those era if that one theory is true in that era. Now here's the motif I'm talking about. There's a normal guy. You can't see it very well, but this is a wear jaguar baby. And now sometimes the guy is not, sometimes the guy has a wear jaguar look too. Okay. Most of them are normal guys, about 60%, about 40% have, are guys with the wear jaguar look, adult males. Like a wear jaguar baby. Okay. Here's another one, but here's a guy with the wear jaguar look. Okay. He's got the deformed skinny head and um, holding a wear jaguar baby. Yeah, all over the place. I don't know what that story is. Here's another guy hanging out with his deformed head, cut lip, real confident. Yeah, because he's cool with his culturally created ought self. Really cool. If again, one of those theories is correct. Now here's a normal guy. If we don't understand why he's normal. And we don't even understand what he's doing. He's called the wrestler. Archaeologists have called him the wrestler. It looks like he's warming up for a wrestling match. But he happens to be normal. Uh, this here is a uh, <clears throat> fish. Yeah, okay. Okay, all right. These are little figurines here. They're just a few inches tall. You see a bunch of old men guys, and they all seem pretty confident because they got their heads deformed. They all feel like they're handsome and hanging out on the street corner, maybe checking out the girls. I don't know. But of course, they could be gods too. It could be totally mythological. Maybe nobody really looked that way. Who knows? Who knows? Okay. But there's tons of those all over the place. And here's some of the big heads. I stand by this head, I come up to about right here. Yeah. And then each, but each head, none of the heads have the wear jaguar look. And they must have been rulers of some kind. So that again adds to the mystery. Each head has a different personality. And this guy's into piercings. It's like a kid I saw in the mall the other day. Yeah, yeah, had a girl walking with him. Oh, I wonder why, but anyway, yeah. And then there's another guy. Here's another guy. They were all distinct individuals. You can tell because their faces are all different. They were all distinct individuals. We don't know what they were. We assume they were rulers of some kind. We don't know what they were and why those huge heads were created in the first place. Yeah. This guy seems like a nice fella here. Seems like he had a nice personality. This guy here, I'm not sure this guy had a nice personality. I'd rather be ruled by the guy up here than the guy here. Yeah. I feel sorry for this guy. I feel sorry for this guy. You know, I said that everyone could be a sex symbol in some culture somewhere. Maybe I'm wrong here. I don't know. 
Anyway, I feel sorry for this guy, but they were real people. They were real people. And it goes on and on and on. Yeah. And here's another one of these motifs. A guy, I can tell if he's wear Jaguar or not because of his hat, probably normal, holding a wear Jaguar baby. Again, one of the most poignant stories for a thousand years, and we may never know what it was. Yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah, interesting stuff. Now, of course, the wear Jaguar can be totally mythological. Maybe no one ever looked that way. And the myriads of representations might not be based on anything historical. They may have nothing to do with kids born with uh, disabilities or anything like that. We don't know. The bottom line, all this is we just don't know. However, there is one thing we do know. An ancient civilization was buried and forgotten for 2,000 years in the jungles of Southern Mexico. And buried with it was a story, a story of a half-human, half-jaguar god baby resting in the loving arms of a human male guardian. And it was one of the most powerful stories in the ancient world, probably. And as the ruins have been unearthed, the story seems to hang over the land like the morning jungle fog yet is as elusive as the jaguar whose howl echoes through the distant hills still. still. There still are jaguars there. However, there's a message in many mysteries. Through the jungle mist, you can hear the whisper. In some cultures, if you are born with certain defects, you can be the object of rejection and pity, while in others, you can be a god. You can be a god. The power of culture can never be underestimated. You know, in closing, I just wanted to say to many of you out there, who you out there seem like you're around my age, you've seen a lot of change in your lifetime, a lot of cultural change here in the United States. Some of the change has been good. Some of the change probably has not been so good. It's been that way in all cultures and all throughout world history. However, as things change around us, we should never stop questioning things. We should never just go with the flow. Example of that is when I was um, in college in 1975, I was in ROTC. In 1975, but just after the Vietnam era, I never served in the real military because I, when I was after my freshman year, I decided I wanted to be a college professor and I knew I had at least 10 years of education ahead of me. <clears throat> I knew that a military commitment would probably just put me even further and further behind. For that year, I was in ROTC and I was in the Ranger unit in ROTC, Special Forces. I thought I was really cool. I had a black beret I would wear and and I enjoyed going up in the mountains, having war games. Every time I went up in the mountains to have war games, I got killed every single time. In fact, one time I killed three people after I had been killed in the war games. I just didn't tell them I was already dead. But um, so probably best I didn't join the real military. But anyway, when I'd walk around campus in 1975 with my army uniform on, People would make fun of me. There'd be this cool guy walking with a pretty girl and they'd look at me and he'd smile and whisper something to her and she'd look at me and giggle. I was made fun of all the time. In fact, one time I was about to go out on war games again and I had my face all painted, camouflaged and I was in my uniform and I wanted to send a picture home to my parents. So I had my roommate come outside and by, and by my dorms as I stood by the dorms to get a picture of me. I left. And I was wearing my uniform and looking really good. And my dorms were about eight stories high in there somewhere. And I was standing on the edge of the dorms. And as I was standing there, getting ready to get my picture taken, 
a bucket of water fell on my head and people from way up there started making fun of me and yelling at me. This is in 1975. And most of you out there from what I could see from the pictures realize what happened because you are familiar with that era. Not all of you, but many of you. Those of you who are young out there are thinking, you gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. How could that happen? Now we live in a different era where military people are much more respected and thank heavens they are much more respected. But see, the culture demands it. I guarantee that 50% of those out there that are telling our military brothers and sisters, thank you for your service, would be throwing buckets of water on them in 1975. It's sad how people never, don't, never question how their culture is influencing them. When we don't critically examine the paradigms of our culture, we become unknowing agents of the prevailing cultural consciousness. You know, what an honor it has been to be invited to do this presentation today. I express gratitude to the Museum of Idaho for inviting me and for all of you for being kind enough to show up. And thanks to all of you for your support of the Museum of Idaho, what a great institution that is. And remember, if any of you wanna know more about some of these cultural specifics and other things like this, and a lot of more interesting stories about the ancient world and archeology, span it's all in my book. For Deep Thinkers Only, John J. Ivers. I, and you can find it at barnesandnoble.com. At barnesandnoble.com, just type in my name and it should come up. Okay. And uh, it's a very inexpensive book as well. Anyway, again, thank you very much for attending. And you know what? It's almost Friday. Isn't that great? Have a good one.